Okay. Um, welcome everyone to our, our latest edition of PidGIP's IP Speaker Series. We're really happy to have Blake Reed with us today, who's a friend of really everyone in our, our program, but Vicki Phillips insisted that she's actually the true best friend of Blake and so deserves the honor of introducing him. So I turn it over to the director of our IP clinic, uh, Vicki Phillips, to introduce uh, Blake Reed, who's the director of Colorado's. Vicki, over to you. Oh, thanks, Don. Wow. Okay. Well, I did. I, I don't know that I claimed that, but I did grab this opportunity to welcome Blake because he I'm just so honored. He, he's a great friend. He's a great colleague. Um, and for him to join this IP speaker series this morning um, to discuss his really wonderfully important piece, copyright and disability, I could not pass up the opportunity. So I knocked Sean off the, the podium for this one. Um, so just, just briefly, you know, long before Blake was a Twitter influencer, you know, think ketchup, think Crocs, think furry Crocs. Um, and, and before there was even a Twitter, right? And before there was even one tweet, um, Blake has long been the intellectual spark and energy behind so much good public interest IP and communications advocacy, and so much of it in that overlooked world of disability access to the wonders of our communication technologies, as well as the IP issues related to news information and all of the creative content that we all should have access to. Um, his latest article in the California Law Review that you'll hear about today is a great testament. It's the culmination, I think, it was to some extent of his passion and his commitment to access um, for all. And this program, this IP program, our IP program here at WCL has always looked at the intersection of IP and other disciplines. We, we pioneered the gender and IP series looking at the intersection of IP and gender, and, and Blake's piece is a wonderful look at, at sort of the, the, the intersection of, of disability and copyright law, which we as, as practitioners, because Blake and I both direct clinics, we encounter in our daily, um, our daily lives, our daily representations of clients. Um, so Blake is, as, as Sean said, the director of the Samuelson Glushko Technology Law and Policy Clinic. For the IP aficionados out there, he tried to register the trademark, but he got a confusingly similar rejection to my own Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Clinic. So sorry about that, Blake. Um, and he's also the, the faculty director of the Telecom and Platforms Initiative at the Silicon Flat Iron Center. Uh, before he joined Colorado as a professor, he worked alongside our good friend Angela Campbell where he was a graduate fellow in First Amendment and Media Law at Georgetown Law's um, Institute for Public Representation. And as I recall, I think he actually was a fellow with one of our wonderful former students um, who was over there with him. He also clerked for Justice Nancy Rice on the Colorado Supreme Court after getting his law degree at Colorado Law, where of course he was editor in chief of the Journal on Telecommunications and High Technology Law. And there he worked with our, our other incredible colleagues, Phil Weiser and Brad Bernthal. Um, so suffice it to say that Brad, uh, Blake has been, you know, uh, an instrumental and vital member of the IP technology, clinical and disability compute communities his entire career and a great friend of our program. Um, with all he does, I don't know how he found the time to write this piece. Uh, but for those of you who know him, Blake is a force of nature from the Rockies an inspiration to his students and a really super fun guy. And I'm really proud to call him my friend and have the chance to welcome him to the Pitch Up series this morning. All yours, Blake. Well, well Vicki, um, thanks so much for the generous introduction. And I can only respond briefly and say that um, the work I did on this is a direct result of the encouragement and mentorship that I, I got from you and from the um, the example of, of your work, um, which was a, a real guide to me as I as I got my my start and, and has been ever since. So um, you're 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 a real inspiration to me and 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 that that means so much. Um, all of the um, embarrassing but but very nice nice things you just said, and I, I appreciate it. 
Um, I also just want to thank before I get started, um, Sean, uh, thank you for, for pulling this program together and to your whole whole team at, uh, at AU, um, Michael and Lucas and Tanya, um, really appreciate um, your generosity of, of time and spirit and, and, and making a, a little bit of room for me to um, discuss this work, which was a, a real labor of love. Um, and also really uh, grateful to the folks that are uh, going to offer some comments today. Um, my uh, my colleague Jack Bernard uh, is is going to be here, and uh, Jack is someone who's also deeply informed all my thinking on on all of these issues. Um, real honor to to have uh, Justice Yakub here, and and really looking forward uh, to to his remarks, and and also um, my my colleague from from Cape Town, uh, Caroline Nakube, who uh, who helped uh, as I was getting getting my work on these these issues going, and and has been. Um, um, just a, a wonderful friend and co-author. Um, also want to just say a quick thanks to the student editors at the California Law Review who persisted through, uh, I think I had something like 350 footnotes of real nasty historical stuff that they had to go uh, traipse to the, through the library to find and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so really appreciate them. And um, also want to acknowledge some, some folks from the, from the disability rights world that, that helped get me oriented to these issues. Uh, Mark Reichert, Eric Bridges, Paul Schrader, and, and Howard Rosenblum. Um, real, uh, real credit to them. So if I say anything smart today, it is, uh, it is a credit to them. If, I, if anything you disagree with, totally my fault. Um, and I should say a, a disclaimer, I, I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Um, not on behalf of my clinic, my clients, or any of my institutional affiliations. Um, and last, I, I, I feel compelled to mark the um, the 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 conflict in uh, Ukraine, which is is deeply heartbreaking on on so many levels. Um, and I don't have anything profound or smart to say about that, um, but just to say that I, I'm grateful, um, despite uh, our, our world being in some some conflict that. Um, we're able to connect across uh, great distances and so, so thrilled to see folks from from uh, all over the world on the, the guest list today and um, engage in, in some critical discourse, uh, given everything going on. All right, enough with the, the pleasantries. I'm going to jump into it. Um, so I, I called this paper Copyright and Disability, but maybe it should have had a question mark at the end, Copyright and Disability. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. But first, I want to tell you what I'm not going to talk about today. And if, uh, if this is disappointing to you, I promise we can get to it in the questions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about copyright doctrine. I presume most of the the, the folks in the room um, are going to be pretty familiar with the idea of how the remediation of an inaccessible copyrighted work, a book or a movie, uh, for example, adding uh, captions or audio descriptions or making a braille uh, copy of a work might implicate various exclusive rights of a copyright holder and the role of exceptions and limitations in copyright law um, to permit both people with disabilities to engage in self-help remediation and for third-party institutions like libraries and schools to engage in third-party remediation of works. Um, what I want to talk instead about today is how and why copyright has become a prominent issue in the landscape of disability law and policy. I think about the broader social problem that we're aiming to address here um, is the accessibility of copyrighted works, and that's not necessarily or exclusively a question of copyright law. So in other words, I don't want to talk about copyright for its own sake, but I want to talk about the broader social context and history of disability rights uh, into which copyright fits in this context. And one bit of motivation for this piece uh, was reading about the Marrakesh Treaty, which uh, I'm sure many folks in the room uh, have been involved with in various capacities when it was finalized. Um, and my initial thinking, being very naive about this, I thought, gosh, this looks an awful lot like the regime that we have in the United States under the Chafee Amendment, plus these novel um, cross-border provisions. Um, and the situation in terms of access to books here in the United States is, is to put it mildly, not, not great. Um, but I read a lot of rhetoric around the enactment of the Marrakesh Treaty about how it was going to address the book famine, um, how, how it might solve the, the book famine. And what I started to worry about, and the seed kind of grew over time, is that this rhetoric conflates a couple of issues. The first issue is whether copyright exceptions and limitations can mitigate copyright liability for third-party efforts to make copyrighted works accessible. Undoubtedly, that's true. 
But there's a second issue, which is whether copyright exceptions and limitations are sufficient to guarantee the ubiquitous accessibility of copyrighted works. In other words, equal access or equitable access um, to, to creative mediums. And I think this is a much murkier and much harder question. And I think untangling this conflation, pulling apart both these issues, reveals some critical questions that we've got to answer if our goal is to make copyrighted works accessible. And one question is, is third party remediation the exclusive or only way to approach the accessibility of works? And to answer this question, uh... part, we might turn to disability law. Does disability law address the possibility of holding copyright holders or authors or the surrounding distribution ecosystem responsible for accessibility? Why aren't we talking about the responsibility of copyright holders to make their own works available in accessible formats? Why should we give copyright holders a pass on what amounts to a discriminatory choice to create and distribute works in fundamentally inaccessible formats? And then what role does disability law play with this dynamic in terms of its placement of responsibilities, not on copyright holders, but on third parties, for example, schools and libraries to make copyrighted works accessible. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not meant to be a critique of the Herculean efforts that third parties like schools and libraries do and must undertake. Rather, I'm asking why we are thinking only about third parties as the actors responsible for accessibility. Okay, so that's disability law, but there's copyright law questions too. Why do we find it necessary to vest rights holders with the ability to demand permission for others to engage in remediation when they've made a discriminatory choice not to make their works accessible in the first place? Incentives to rights holders uh, to voluntarily create and distribute their works in accessible formats to communities of people with disabilities that number in the tens of millions uh, in the United States. Um, and relatedly, what did this, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this today, but what does that say about the extent to which the copyright system um, deserves, serves disabled creators? And I think that's an important question um, that often gets lost. So I don't have answers to all these questions. Um, for the paper that I'm hoping some of you have had a chance to read today, I dove into the history of copyright intersection with disability in this country, and I went down the rabbit hole of two case studies, tactile printing and closed captions. And I'm going to spend most of my time on the first case study in just a moment on the second at the end. Forge, forge ahead here with with apologies to for, for the the disruption so i'm going to spend uh, the bulk of my time today talking about this case study of uh, of tactile printing um, and, and I offer the caveat, the case studies that I go through in this paper um, are not exhaustive of categories of works in disability communities. They're not necessarily comparable in every respect, and they don't account for the radical transformation that the internet has brought about in this context. But I think they have important lessons for copyright's role in disability law and policy. Um, the imperatives for disability law to address the accessibility of copyrighted works and copyright's capacity as a lens for solving social problems. So let's let's jump in and, and I, I'm going to talk about book accessibility, but I'm going to focus pr uh, primarily on tactile printing and reading, um, and namely, namely Braille here, though that's obviously not exhaustive of the accessibility issues with the written word or much less more, more generally. Um, and I'm going to gloss over the history here. I'm going to go fast. And obviously the paper um, unpacks this in a lot more detail, but a, a couple of points to highlight. Highlight. Um, one is the implicit discrimination of the written word. I think it's critical to understand that the written word and the industries that grew up around it um, persisted for on the order of thousands of years, depending on how you want to measure it, before we even conceived of the notion of tactile printing. And across those thousands of years, the implicit discrimination against people with print disabilities went largely unchecked, despite the critical role of the written word um, in the evolution evolu evolution of human civilization, and even before we see the rudiments of the modern copyright system coming about. And when I say discrimination, I don't mean intentional discrimination or overt or, or, or sort of uh, uh, on, on purpose discrimination against people with disabilities, but it's an omissive form of discrimination, which as scholars like Sam Bagenstos have written, um, is pernicious nevertheless in its effects. 
Then we see the introduction of tactile printing and most folks will be familiar with Braille and the story of, of Louis Braille. Um, we actually see conceptual tactile printing systems that go back as far as the 16th and 17th centuries when doctors and priests and teachers began conceiving of communications with raised dots. But it took hundreds of years of technological development before Louis Braille was uh, conceived his systems and decades longer than that before the standards were over competing tactile standards started to arrive at consensus. And in the US, this is all happening against the backdrop of a nascent copyright system where policymakers and publishers are largely unattentive to the development of tactile printing, either as a market opportunity or as an infringement concern. Okay, so around the Civil War in the United States, we finally begin to systematize tactile printing. But I think we make a critical choice here, and that choice is not to interrogate the role of publishers. Instead, we focus on the economic challenges of tactile printing for third parties. And we do that in the 1858 American Printing House Act. And we get a solution that actually looks not so different from what we have today. A third party institution, the American Printing House, tasked with creating accessible versions of books distributed via schools and funded by the government. And this program evolves over the coming decades into a nationalized form that culminates in the 1931 Pratt Smoot Act, um, which puts significant emphasis on remediation by the National Library Service. And it was here that copyright finally makes an entrance. Why does copyright come into the mix? Well, it's a result of the dual role of the Library of Congress and the Copyright Office, which are increasingly responsible for guiding American copyright policy in the lead up to the 1976 Copyright Act, but also an increasingly important home for tactile printing with the NLS. And it's at this nexus where the copyright and accessibility stories converge. Now, I can't find a genesis moment for exactly why this happened. Was it a demand of publishers? Was it driven by the library's increasing proximity to the interests and influence of rights holders? I don't know. But whatever the impetus, the legislative history of the 76 Act makes it very clear that the library had a practice of asking permission of publishers to create accessible versions of books. And the arguments made during the hearings before the 1976 Act underscore that publishers both felt strongly that they were entitled to be asked permission and that by granting that permission, they were engaged in a beneficent and altruistic act. And again, there's little discussion in these hearings of the possibility that publishers should be responsible for the accessibility of their works. That suggestion would have been radical in this context. Publishers instead seemed to instead to almost be seeking praise um, for granting permission uh, to remediate their works without insisting on a substantial payment. Now, whatever you think of these arguments in theory, a problem arose in practice. The publishers were increasingly inattentive to requests for permission and delayed the work of the National Library Service as a result, and this led to complaints from distributing institutions and readers. So we get two legislative developments in the 1976 Act. Doctrinally, we get some recognition that fair use can be a tool um, to cover one-off remediation and self-help, which later gets recognized by the Supreme Court in Sony and elaborated in, in much more detail on by the Second Circuit in Hathi Trust. For broader uses, we get a little appreciated but important predecessor to the Chafee Amendment, and that's Section 710 uh, of the Copyright Act of 1976 which is no longer no longer exists has since been repealed it charges the copyright office with promulgating by regulation standard forms to secure publishers permission to remediate works and I, I have to highlight this we've gone to the point of pressing a government agency into streamlining the forms it uses to ask for permission for the agency to freely reproduce works in accessible formats Permission, which is rarely withheld, but demanded purely on principle, um, out of a sense of entitlement stemming from the grant of a copyright. And this approach turns out to be a major problem as securing permission from the publishers, despite the streamlining, continues to lead to delays and continues to deny um, print disabled readers access to books. 
I think this dynamic is further entrenched, though certainly not intentionally, um, by the development of disability rights law in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. We get the Rehabilitation Act, the predecessors to IDEA, and, and ultimately IDEA itself, and ultimately the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the common thread I see through all of them in this context is that they all assign responsibility for making books in accessible formats, not to publishers, but to third parties schools, libraries, places of employment, government agencies and services and programs, and so forth. So we wind up with a pernicious dynamic. Third-party institutions that use books in their activities, including making them available to the public in the case of libraries, or teaching from them in the case of schools, are legally required under disability law with making them available in accessible formats. But publishers insist on being asked permission for remediation and are often delinquent in providing it in a timely way. And so the result is that people with disabilities are denied access to books even in this third party model. And finally, we hit a breaking point and we get the Chafee Amendment to the Copyright Act, Section 121, which many are, are, are no doubt familiar with. And I think against this hist historical backdrop, the Chafee Amendment is actually not that new. It basically just takes all the provisions of Section 710, which follow on the provisions of the um, Pratt Smoot Act, which follow on the provisions of the American Printing House Act, and it just turns them into a compulsory license. And the publishers are at the table on this. They said, we are tired of being asked about this. Like we, we give up, we, we cry uncle. Um, and there's a compromise reached and we turn this into a compulsory license in the Chafee Amendment. So I wanna dwell on this point for a second and then I'll, I'll begin to wrap up. Chafee basically returns the United States back to the Civil War era status quo when it comes to copyright. Basically, now we're in a world where third parties don't have to ask publishers permission that the publishers have no interest in denying them. We haven't imposed any obligations on publishers. We haven't retooled the copyright system's incentive structures to require accessibility in any way. We basically have spent a century allowing copyright's permission structure to creep into the accessibility of books for no particular social benefit, either to rights holders or to readers. And now with Chafee, we've reversed that incursion partially, but only partially because it's only for books and it's only for a limited range of disability communities. And we lack similar protections other than under fair use to this day um, for other creative mediums and other disability communities. And then we bake the rudiments of Chafee into the Marrakesh Treaty, and those more involved with the negotiation and development of the treaty than I can speak to this uh, more authoritatively. But we see a lot of the constructs of Chafee finding their way into the, Ch in, into the Marrakesh Treaty. And we entrench in so doing a lot of the problematic assumptions that have led to our not very good state of affairs in the United States that third party remediation is basically the exclusive approach to book accessibility, that copyright is necessarily a prima facie barrier, and that exceptions and limitations, including the notion of cross-border exchange, are sort of our only way out of the book famine. Okay, so things have improved somewhat in addition to these copyright law developments, we now have under disability law in the United States, accessibility obligations placed on a wide range of third parties. Many, including librarian uh, libraries, have undertaken these enormous efforts to remediate their collections, despite headwinds from publishers. And given the long tail of inaccessible archival content, this is pretty inescapable that we're going to have third party remediation. But those third parties are often not well are at least not ideally positioned to effectuate accessibility. They may lack the resources to do it. They may not have the expertise required to do it, and they may face really tall technical challenges to doing it. And worldwide, these approaches are often lacking. When Caroline and I surveyed countries about their positive disability laws in our post marrakesh survey, we found that many recipients of the survey didn't even understand the question, didn't understand the notion of, uh, of the, the interaction between disability law and copyright law. Okay, um, Sean, I want to quick ask before I wind up here, have I got a couple more minutes or am I running over on time? I don't know how badly we got de derailed. I'll stop here if we're- You're fine. Keep going. All right. We got a couple more minutes. So I want to ask, is this the way? Is this the right way to approach the accessibility of creative works? 
And I offer a countervailing example, which is the example of closed captions. Now, again, I don't mean to draw apples to apples comparisons. There's a lot, a lot of differences here, but we have a really similar origin story. The introduction of talkie movies systemically discriminates in a way that's really devastating to the deaf community, um, denies them the ability to go to the movies, which they have had during the silent movie era. And there are many years of technical struggle to develop viable captioning technology. And of course, third parties are leading the way, not the movie industry. So there's a need to find ways to fund their works. And there's an incredible coincidence Captioned films nearly wound up at the library and at the Library of Congress. There was a bill supported by acting librarian Verna Clapp that would have put captioned films in a lending program parallel to the National Library Service. The bill's proponents love this idea because actually one of the biggest challenges in the 1950s, 1960s was sourcing prints of movies from copyright holders who were reluctant to provide them for the purpose of creating captioned versions because they were worried about copyright infringement. And the Library of Congress's collection of movies was one of the biggest collections in the world. But according to a firsthand account of the bill's proponents, things went sideways when the permanent librarian returned and told them that he did not want the library to provide captioned films, and he likewise didn't support the National Library Service. And so they went elsewhere. Captioning took a significant turn. And under the Closed Caption Loan Service Act, they housed responsibility for this program in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Health Education and Welfare eventually worked with Congress to secure a substantial investment in captioning technology. This later took root in experiments by public broadcasters and eventually found a home at the FCC. And under the 1990 Television Decoder Circuitry Act, all TVs 13 inches or larger, larger were required to include caption decoders. And then most importantly, under the 1996 Telecom Act, requirements phased in over several years required nearly 100% of television programming to be captioned. And the big difference here was that disability law placed regulations directly on video programming industry to internalize those negative externalities of inaccessibility, right? It said, you have to figure this out. And what about copyright? While some regulated entities did what I will call concern trolling to the FCC about copyright issues, the FCC, I think largely because it's not an expert agency on copyright, basically ignored them and sent the message, you guys do a lot of contracts. You do a lot of licenses with each other around the distribution of video. Go figure it out. Make sure that it's accessible at the end. Sort out these copyright issues amongst yourselves. And eventually, and ultimately, the video industry has largely done that, or at least had largely done that in the era of television. OK, so we've got different economies of scale between these case studies. The long tail of accessible archival content is much bigger and longer when it comes to books. But nevertheless, I think there's some lessons we can draw here. We can see from tactile printing that copyright can and does cause significant problems for accessibility. Those problems are with us perhaps permanently because of the decisions that we've made, the legacy that we have for how to approach this problem. And as a result, we need copyright exceptions and limitations to enable third party remediation. And indeed, anything less than robust limitations and exceptions requires an ableist frame and it leads to ableist results. But then this is the best we have right now. But we can also recognize that relying exclusively on third party remediation means that people with disabilities are always going to trail behind in terms of access to a creative medium relative to people who can access copyrighted works right off the bat. And we see from television that it's possible to require creative industries to address accessibility directly via disability, or in this case, telecom law. And that requires policymakers to, some, to recognize that sometimes copyright simply is not the right lens, it's not the right tool for solving all of the distributive injustice that can result from the growth of a creative industry. And it requires recalibrating disability law to more directly target the accessibility, not only of places and services and of third parties, parties, but of creative works themselves. All right, I've gone on for too long. Um, I'm very much looking forward uh, to the discussion. Um, thanks very much for your time. Look forward to your questions. And Sean, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, thank, thank you, Blake. Um, you know, huge, huge applause. Uh, my heart is still racing from all that. You are the speakers. So you did very well to pull us through our little terrorism incident. 
We've actually done, uh, I think, over 40 of these this year, and that's the first one of those this year. So I don't know why they picked you, but we'll, uh, we'll clamp down on it <laughs> in the future and review our uh, procedures so it doesn't happen again. Um, we have uh, a, a few uh, very esteemed uh, colleagues that have agreed to give short comments. Um, I'm really happy to have Justice Zach, uh, Zach Yacoub with us, who was the first blind constitutional court justice uh, in South Africa, is responsible for a number of their um, really important decisions, uh, including while I was on the court, the Hrupum decision, which is uh, in you know, pretty much every comparative constitutional uh, law casebook around, um, and is also now uh, very much a copyright reform advocate during uh, the copyright reform that's going on in South Africa right now. So um, Zach, can I invite you to come and, and give a first comment? Zach, you are muted. I think I can unmute you, maybe. Hello, I'm now unmuted. Am I there? Yep, now you're here. And am I here on the video as well? You're not on the video. Let me. Now you are. Right. OK. Hello, everyone, and, and, and thank you very much. That Blake was a wonderful address, but I would like to go a little bit broader in the five minutes that I have, much broader. And I would like to take my cue from what you said at the end, Blake, which was distributive injustice. And I would like to go opposite that and talk about distributive justice and make the point that the problem is not really about people with disability and copyright. The disability and copyright troubles that we see are symptomatic of much broader worldwide trouble. The worldwide troubles of racism, troubles against gender, troubles against people with disability, troubles against people with gay and orientation or, or uh, gay and different types of orientation. So really, it is the majority who take the view that they are or the power group, not necessarily the majority, the power group take the view that they are right, that capital is right, that money making is the sole exercise and there is no morality in society. I learned this morning that the poor women in the American Soccer Association, women soccer players, got equal pay only as a result of a decision delivered today or yesterday or the day before yesterday or something. So that is a huge trouble. And therefore the whole trouble is how to change society and the world overall to render it an inclusive society. Because absent that inclusive society, symptoms like disability, uh, publication troubles and braille problems and so on are one of the few. People with disabilities suffer, women suffer, black people suffer all over the world. And I think that broadly speaking, unless we get there, we're not gonna get anywhere. And therefore for me, while the thing about whether it should be disability law or not is an important issue. It is not really, uh, it, it, is all, it, it is a symptomatically important issue. And therefore we need to bear that in mind. So that's the first point I wanted to make, which is the broad issue. And then we find that people with disability discriminate against other disabilities, so a deaf person refuses, a blind person refuses to be driven by a deaf driver, for example, which has happened in many parts of the world. And then you find that authors who have a disability also stick by their rights, also get chapped by publishers. 
And that gets me into the publisher, publisher author syndrome. I would suggest that the publisher is too much about making money. Authors are caught up with that in some ways and authors must be able to make up their mind in relation to what they do and how they do it. And authors need to be able to put their foot down in relation to publishers. Victoria mentioned in her article, Helen Keller. Many people don't understand that Helen Keller, Helen Keller was far more than just a disability activist. She was an activist for non-racism and for equality. And she was closely involved in those things. And all of us forget that. So that the relationship between a disability and its trouble is symptomatic of a broader, bigger problem. And until and unless we begin to attack that, we will not get too far. We will get somewhere because I don't, I have been busy with disability problems virtually all my life. And I think we have got somewhere and made, made disability things a bit better. But at the same time, I have also been involved in the broader struggle for non-racialism, non-sexism, and non-discrimination against everybody. Because unless we make it one struggle, it is going to be a serious, serious problem. So I'm sorry, Blake, I just wanted to put, a, to put it into a broader, different context, which is that we are talking about a symptom in a broader society, which is becoming a bigger and bigger mess as we go along. I think my five minutes are now over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Yakub. It's a it's a very uh, a South African uh, perspective to to think about the one struggle. You know, how, how do we unite it all into the one struggle? Thank you for that. Um, so we have with us uh, Jack Bernard, who's an old colleague of of Blake and is um, working as associate general counsel at the University of Michigan. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Blake, uh, for a great uh, discussion and for just a lovely article. Uh, I would encourage you all, if you haven't actually read the article, to, uh, to take the opportunity to do so because it shines some light on a largely unheralded history. And I think it, it will be useful to get a sense of the kind of context um, in, in which this discussion is taking place. So I, I have a few general uh, thoughts that I, I want to share here. Uh, in the in the time I have. First, it's important to, when you think about the confluence of disability and copyright to, to step back and realize that it has never been the case. I cannot find a single example of, of this, uh, the proposition I'm putting forward right now, that copyright law at any time, anywhere has had as an objective interfering with the participation of people who have disabilities in society. This has never been something that's raised. Uh, people aren't pounding their chests saying, we're really worried about how people who have disabilities are infringing on, on copyright. We're, we're concerned, we, we want to put an end to this. We want to create a barrier. If anything is the case, it is the opposite, that there is robust effort in the United States and in many other countries to make society more equitable. So one challenge we face is, because we don't have a really specific assertion, a clear, robust, broad assertion uh, in the copyright law that, that the public should be able to make uses that enable works to become accessible, whether it's uh, individuals or third parties helping people re remediate works, uh, whether it is publishers who don't have to worry about getting permission from authors or third parties to remediate works. Um, we need a, a more robust statement because people do worry about these kinds of things. You know, there's a pretty aggressive uh, copyright uh, thick um, uh, position out there where people think the, the rights are so robust, they really control just about everything. And I, I think in the face of that, we need a much clearer statement that says, yeah, th it was never intended to interfere here. If there is a quintessential fair use, is the use uh, of enabling people who uh, need access to copyrighted works, access that everyone else gets, 
um, to enable those folks to, to access those copyrighted works. Um, and, and so I, I do think a, a, a clearer statement would go a long way. I mean, there, I, I was a, an attorney on the Hottie Trust case, and I can tell you overwhelmingly, people are not interested in interfering with people who have disabilities. Although in that circumstance, we did encounter a few people, publishers, authors, who said, I don't care whether people who have disabilities get access. It's fine with me that they don't get access. We had a few folks who were like that, but overwhelmingly, people were just more concerned about what they envisioned as their rights. And so I think there are opportunities that this article um, can be a part of to change the narrative. I'm working with a group of people right now who are trying to get um, theatrical productions on Broadway to be more accessible to people like myself um, who have vision disabilities. And the, the objective is to have live uh, audio descriptions. Um, and what's fascinating is I, I met with this group and they're very concerned and theater owners are concerned and, and production managers are concerned that they will be trespassing upon the copyrights of, uh, of whoever holds those rights. And this gives people permission to not do what they even think they ought to do, which is why we need a, a more robust uh, statement. Now, I know you might be thinking that the the Marrakesh Treaty or the Chafee Amendment or Section 121A um, are, are important uh, solutions. Well, they are steps forward, but they're just steps. They really affect a narrow bandwidth of works and a narrow bandwidth of disabilities. I often hear people talk about disability as if there's a disability community. Um, and there's some, there's some communities uh, of people who have disabilities. There are deaf communities in places, but even people who are deaf are not one community. It's a constituency and the constituency is very broad. So there is no one solution that solves everybody's problem, which is why we need both proactive, a little bit uh, like what Blake was calling for, this idea that publishers could do more um, or we could create laws that inspire publishers to do more but they won't be able to anticipate every need. So we also need responsive opportunities. And this is where fair use comes into play or perhaps some new, uh, some new law that um, acknowledges that the people who are making legitimate accommodations uh, don't have to worry about uh, becoming copyright infringers. And I, I guess I've probably eclipsed my time here, but I, um, I'm happy to engage around this when we get to the question and answer. And I. I, um, I really applaud your work here, Blake. It's a thrill always to be in your presence. And I, I will say, I have not seen a more indefatigable person looking to support people who have disabilities, to give people equitable access. And, and it, is, it is always wonderful to be in your presence. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, another longtime collaborator with Blake, Caroline, and Kube also hails from South Africa, a professor at, at uh, University of Cape Town and has been working with Blake on um, a series of reports on, on disability issues in the Marrakesh Treaty implementation at WIPO. Uh, Caroline, over to you. Thank you, Sean. Um, and, um, Blake, always a pleasure to listen to you speak. And I really enjoyed reading both your paper um, and listening to your comments. And so what I have to share, I suppose, would be um, some thoughts about the value of this paper and, and how you explained it to us this evening. And then also just to perhaps ask a few questions of some of the people um, here in the virtual room with us to see how that could translate to some of the work that they work in. So, you know, the historical overview of, of the Chaffee Amendment and how it came to be and your juxtaposition of that case study um, with other, you know, with, with the film and video to show that you can get a, a different result from following a, a different approach. That is so important um, because what it does for me and hopefully for others is that it shows that um, to the extent that the Marrakesh Treaty is informed by the Chaffee Amendment, then of course we need to be cautious because what you're showing us here masterfully is that you have a national approach from the states, um, flawed as it is, um, that then informs the international framework 
through the Marrakesh Treaty, which then becomes almost a template that countries now find it difficult to break away from. And what I mean by that is that, for example, in South Africa, as we go through the copyright amendment process, um, and when proposals seek to go beyond both Chaffee and Marrakesh, because they are limited, as you've rightfully said, um, the pushback then is, but you can't do that. If you do that, you're non-compliant. So I think that this historical overview, what it then does is to show that even the international framework um, is flawed because it's based or it's informed by national approach um, that is problematic, um, that comes from a very specific uh, kind of historical um, development. So that's really insightful. And I looked at the list of attendees and I saw that there would have been um, some colleagues from Kenya uh, and other African countries who also are looking at um, copyright law reform for whom this might be useful. So I hope that they, they lashed onto that. And if they're not actually in the room, that later on when they view the recording, that this is something that they could um, take with. And then the second thing that I wanted to perhaps comment on would be that um, these two case studies that you've shown us um, shows very clearly that copyright law um, has a role to play in, you know, in, in, um, in meeting some, some requirements, some needs, some pressing needs, but it is by no means the only answer. So you've shown us how disability law, how telecommunications law all have a role to play in this particular instance. And so I see that in the room, there are colleagues who are perhaps working on other exceptions and limitations beyond those for the disability constituency. And so what I wanted to say to them is how then can we take this learning about the place of copyright law in, in trying to to generate better laws, to then start to think about what the areas of law, which ones might be relevant to other exceptions and limitations. So there are people in the room, and this is my very last 30 seconds, um, who are working with um, open educational resources. Um, I see people from, people from archives in special collections. Um, I see senior human rights officers. And so I can see that they're probably interested in other exceptions and limitations. And I'm hoping that when they get an opportunity, they might perhaps tell us how they're taking these case studies um, to heart and how they might help in work on other exceptions and limitations. But um, I think I'll stop there for now and time permitting, maybe come back later. Thanks, Sean. Super, thank, thank you, Caroline. Um, so we'll, we'll turn it over. Blake, you're welcome to respond to any or all of the comments that you've heard. And then we still have uh, 30 minutes or so in the public session to take other comments from the audience. And then we'll turn off the cameras and you know, have a party. So go ahead. All, all right, Copy, copyright law party on a Friday. Um, I'll, I'll try and spend just a, a couple of minutes here and respond to these very generous comments in turn and leave a lot of time for questions. Looks like a really um, robust uh, conversation happening in the chat and some themes that perhaps we can pick up. Um, so first of all, um, to Justice Yacoub's comments and Justice Yacoub, thank you for, uh, for, for your thoughts on, on that. Um, I think what you have described and what I what I what I heard throughout your comments was describing the difference between the disability rights approach that I sort of articulated in the paper and the broader concept of disability justice as disability rights intertwined with a broader struggle um, to reset power imbalances, to approach the, um, the, the problems of capitalism, um, to approach the problems of injustice more generally than that. And I think just as I was trying to, in this paper, pull disability rights out of the copyright law weeds a little bit. I think you very rightly point out that from that disability rights framework, we're still we're still at too low a level of abstraction. In fact, we must go a level of abstraction higher and think about um, how all of these things that we're talking about are uh, are broader symptoms of of, pow of power imbalances um, that that need to be addressed. So all, all I can say to that is, um, that's an, an inspiration for the next stage of my work and thinking about um, how I frame these things. And, and, and I couldn't agree more um, and, and really appreciate that, that framing. Um, so that's thought number one. Um, a second point, and I'd love to hear from, from folks in the audience on this one, is the 
I, I I didn't distinguish neatly between publishers and authors, and and you'll notice I kind of elided as I was talking about the closed captioning uh, case study as well about the different players in the video industry. And there's an ecosystem here, right? And um, one question I think I don't grapple with much because I, you know, my focus, like I say, is not really copyright law is to think about within the corners of copyright law, how could we calibrate things better um, to, to empower authors who want to pursue accessibility to work with publishers or vice versa? Could we alter the incentive structures of copyright in some way um, to facilitate accessibility? I think there's lots of room for creative approaches to tailoring copyright law and policy to do better on this front. And I, like I say, I come from a disability rights perspective and I'm not sure I have the answers uh, on that front, but I think there's more in the heartland of copyright law, um, perhaps to be done here. Um, and I think that gets to, um, to, to some of uh, Jack's comments about what, what the, what the problem is here that, that there's this sort of omission, but not, uh, not malice in copyright law when it comes to accessibility. The goal is not excluding people with disabilities so much as it is not having a clear statement or not having a, um, a, a an understand a, an affirmative understanding that copyright shouldn't get in the way. Um, and, and one thing that was coming to mind, Jack, as you were delivering your remarks was, what about the progress clause? And what about the 14th Amendment? Um, and, and I, you know, this is a, this is an argument that is hard doctrinally to make, right? But I think about shouldn't the fruits of the progress clause be accessible to everyone and accessible on, on equitable terms? Can we not find some of those statements in, in some of the bedrock of copyright law? And, I, and I, I tend to be an optimist on that. I think, I think that we should and we can. Perhaps we need legislation to do that. Perhaps we need um, more overt statements like the Chafee Amendment, um, like, uh, like cases like Hadi Trust to give us affirmation of that. Um, but I think we have some ingredients in the bedrock of, of copyright law um, on which to draw. Um, I completely agree with your point, Jack, that we need both proactive and responsive policy. And I hope no one will take any disagreement away from my presentation on that point. I, I think we need more proactive policy than we have right now. I think we need disability law to play a role in this space, but that in no way undercuts also the need um, to have policy that enables responsive actions because it's never going to be perfect. We need exceptions and limitations. So just co-sign co um, that point all day long. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to respond uh, Caroline, to, to your comments. And again, thank you so much for them. Um, you know, one thing that was coming to mind for me was the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. As we think about these international implementations and I, I should I should point out here that you know the U.S. is in no position to speak with any authority on these issues, um, given its its failure to ratify the the, the CRPD. Um, but I think one way to think about it, as as uh, as WIPO's member states are um, going about the task of implementing Marrakesh, and and your work and and mine in doing the the post Marrakesh study was was trying to find some of this. We we're looking for this was what about the other obligations under international treaties? What about obligations of countries under the CRPD? Does that provide a helpful source to look at and say, we need to balance what we're doing over here. We need to do what we're doing over here in copyright land with some knowledge and some acknowledgement and some understanding of how it interplays with our obligations under treaties like the CRPD, telecom law, cop and 
disability law and so forth. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with the notion. I, I think that's exactly the right, the right way to think about this, that we need to be in conversation between copyright law, between disability law, between telecom law, to understand how we can come up with holistic policies that lead to good results, both for people with, with disabilities and for, for creators. And by the way, those are not exclusive categories. I have to end again and say, I, I hope someone like my, my, my dearest hope with this paper is that someone will, will read it and say, what about the role of the copyright system um, in serving the needs of creators with disabilities, which is something that I didn't talk about at all. And I think is a great shortcoming of this paper um, that we don't think about disabled creators and how the copyright system might serve them better. And perhaps um, through representation, perhaps through elevating the work of creators with disabilities, we can start to highlight um, some, of the, um, some of the problems here. Um, and so I, I, I've again gone on long enough and love to, love to turn to, to questions from the audience and, and to questions in the chat. Sean, back to you. Super. Well, now we um, turn it over to anyone to jump in. So if you'd like to jump in, ask a question, comment, um, ask that you turn your camera on. You can use the raise hands function. You can also just uh, have a free for all and anybody is, is welcome to just, uh, just shout it out. So while we wait, um, I'm happy for any of the panelists to, to jump in and respond. Jack, I know you were you were responding a little in the text. Um, I know uh, Ian and some others made some interesting comments in the text that I'd welcome people to uh, to bring out. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I'll I'll just say that um, I, I I really do think that the challenge, the monumental challenge for us on the whole is is that um, we we need to help people in society have criteria to strive for. If you just say to a publisher or to anybody, you need to make it accessible to people who have disabilities. This is such a wide open, uh, non-ending, all-consuming task that I think we end up, despite the, the nobleness of the objective, it doesn't help people make actual progress. And so uh, if you give someone too daunting a task, they just say, I'm never gonna be able to do it. I'm not even gonna try at all. And so I think we're, we are better off creating criteria. I mentioned in the comments that some states have criteria for publishers and some publishers pay attention to those criteria, others do not. And states really don't enforce it very well. It's not that there's never been enforcement, but there are many things for states to deal with and there just hasn't been an enormous amount of effort along those lines. But I, I just think any circumstance that we create, even if we created a set of guidance that evolved over time as we knew what the new normal would be, um, it would also have to make room to enable members of the public to make works accessible uh, for themselves, because no law that we could write would ever anticipate the diversity of uses needed to be make, made. This is why disability law is based on a reasonable accommodation model. It's based on one where we're adjusting over time. The first case the Supreme Court ever heard on disability law was was a Southeastern Community College versus Davis. And even there, where the person with a disability ended up losing that case, a nurse who, who, uh, who was deaf, who wanted to be able to uh, become a nurse um, or get an advanced degree as a nurse, um, the court said th the criteria will change over time as technology comes along. And this is precisely how we think about disability law. So even if we create good standards, I think we need to also have a space and in the law that allows people to engage in self-help and that allows industries to pop up to create accommodations for people. Thanks very much. Jack, if I could, if I could chime in on that, I actually think um, I actually think telecom law and the the sort of telecom version of disability law actually gives us one really good tool to do this that we don't see as much in the sort of ADA litigation model of this. And and maybe it's worth just starting with the ADA litigation model of this, which is to say, we sort of hash out inaccessibility in court, right? We go to, to federal court and file a claim under Title III um, and, and seek an injunction to, to remediate. The way that we've approached this in the telecom world is much different. It's 
creates these obligations, right? It creates a regulation for the video programming industry to add closed captions or audio description to video programming. But importantly, one thing that the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act did in 2010 is it created a series of advisory committees that came together and brought industry and brought users and brought technical experts to the table and basically said, the, the, the message is, you need to sit down and sort out the details of these regulations amongst yourself or the agency is going to do it for you and you're not going to like the results, right? Like here's some, here's some overarching parameters. Accessibility is the requirement, but we're going to leave to you to work together to figure out the details. And actually, I think the most remarkable output of the CVA was not that we now have a regulatory scheme and an enforcement mechanism, which is, you know, arguably under enforced to, to some degree, but that a lot of the industry came to the table and got religion about accessibility and said, we need to stop fighting on this. And we, we realize that there's actually so much here that not only serves our interests, but it serves our users' interests. And there is a way forward here. We can figure out a way to marshal the resources and change our process and look at this in a different way. We can build this into our product design. We can build this into our workflows. We can hire accessibility teams. We can start doing a better job of hiring people with disabilities in all sorts of roles in our our, in our companies, right? And I think it, when you look at that, I think that's also, that's a nice compliment to what you're talking about, people being able to engage in self-help is also bringing people together, right? It's bringing people in the same room to say, this is a new challenge. We've got to figure out how to bring accessibility into this new creative medium. How are we going to do it? And how can we come up with a solution that works for everybody? Zach, Zach, over to you. Justice Yacoub, your hand is up, but you're still muted. I can press the unmute for you. Okay, I'm gonna do it for you. I think I can do it for you, or maybe I can't. There you go. You're unmuted. Okay. Thank you very much. Look, the only point I wanted to make is that it is wrong to say that publishers are asking too much of them to make things available to everyone with disability. Because it depends on the society we believe in. We do not want a privilege as people with disability. Women don't. Black people don't. Nobody does. We want our rights as rightful members of our society and accommodation is our absolute and complete right. And we will fight for it all the time. And I'm not saying that disability people fight for our rights only. We, fight, we will fight for everyone's rights until we have a truly equal society. That's all I want to say, thanks. And can someone just unmute me? You want to be muted again? I can mute you again. Yeah, I can. Yep, yep you got it. You're muted. Um, I, I, there's it's a there's a great little kind of dialogue here, actually, between I think between you know U U.S. Uh, disability law, where we have these kind of different positive obligations to withdraw barriers, and then the idea that Justice Yacoub is talking about about not treating disability differently. So if you read the South African constitution, there's positive rights for everybody, not just disabilities. So it's, uh, in fact, the equality clause is framed as a duty to work to achieve quality. So it's not a declaration that everybody's equal now. It's a duty of the state to work to achieve equality for everyone. It assumes that everyone needs help to get there. Um, so I, I think it's just it's just an interesting kind of through line that um, you know d should and it was the uh, Justice Yaku's first point about um, let's let's bring us all together you know and and have um, it, it, we won't we won't succeed unless we make it one struggle uh, which I think uh, is uh, 
it's very Ho very Hofeldian uh, thinking about about the the rights and duties here. I see, Professor mm. Carroll's got his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, actually, I was going to go right there because um, uh, you know I I was thinking listening to the, this point. Of, um, there have been a couple papers. That I, I actually was just looking at. at I can only find a Hein online, therefore inaccessible copy. But David Weaver wrote a nice piece at this point. Uh, I think it was two thousand six or, or two thousand eleven about kind of switching switching them the, the the vocabulary and instead of talking about copyright owners rights uh talk about users rights and copyright owner duties and there have been a couple of other papers about sort of copyright duties um, um and what i think is interesting is uh, in some ways because of the way sean just i mean that's just never been the way we've talked about copyright right um but I do think to me, as we push those of us in the user rights network, as we at least try to push on a model where you have rights owners on both sides and the whole Hofeldian construct kind of can't, can't grok that, right? So um, uh, I, I think we're trying to, you, you know, and basically the whole uh, structure of individual rights jurisprudence doesn't know what to do when you've got uh, two rights owners with adverse interests. Um, but I think it creates this space for the kinds of arguments you're making. And I'm, so I'm making this as a sort of suggestion to other members of the user rights network to think about how do we sort of weave in this notion of, of duty that, that when a you, if a user has a right, then there are some corresponding duties on the other side and that if we are both rights owners, then we as users have certain right duties to respect copyright owners' rights within the domain of their right. But then as users, we have certain rights and the, the copyright owner has certain duties to respect our, our rights. And then we can use that as a framework to articulate what, what our various entitlements are. So thank you for this. It's thought for, I hadn't, so I think there's something more generalizable out of this is, is the point of what I just said and, and thank you. Well, Mike, I wonder if I could respond really, really quickly and say I, I, I love the idea and I love the I, I love the framing of rights and duties here. And there's someone whose uh, anonymity I won't spoil who, who suggested early on in this paper is why don't you um, why don't you suggest that we sort of condition the grant of copyright on you know provision of a work in accessible formats or why don't we start tinkering with the with the provision uh, of, of copyright along those lines, which I think is a really interesting idea. One thing I struggled with, and I'd love to love your thoughts on it, is what about the shadow of creative works that sort of get created and get distributed outside of the realm of copyright or outside of the shadow of copyright? And of course, everything has the copyright automatically. But one of the things that we have thought a lot about on the closed captioning front, as an example, is the long tail of user generated content on platforms like YouTube, right? And for most of the creators on YouTube or the vast, I'd say the creators of the vast majority of video, although not necessarily the most lucrative video on YouTube, they are folks who are operating largely and uh, without knowledge of uh, the fact that copyright overlays on, into their world. What do you think, what do you think about that? I mean, what do you do with that, that group of folks who are creating sort of in, 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 in part of the world where that copyright doesn't really touch? So I think this is one of those places where the platforms have to own that responsibility. There's yep. like asking individual users to own that. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, so uh, as on the ADA side for folks who don't know, there've been some recent uh, decisions about whether e-commerce sites count as places of, a, of public accommodation subject to the ADA. And a recent decision sort of has finally made it very clear that they are. Um, and that's now created um, Unfortunately, I mean, not for just, I mean, people have different views about the plaintiff's lawyers enforcing the ADA uh, aggressively. And, uh, but, but over the Christmas break, I was talking to someone who has a small business uh, hosted on Shopify, whose 
site was not ADA compliant and then had to, to uh, you know, deal with a, a suit. Shopify, though, real is getting a lot of pushback from its merchants who say, you know, I didn't even know this was an obligation I wasn't following. And why didn't you set your site up? So I think pushing on universal design for tech platforms is is the answer. And, you know, that I would love to see. I think, you know, because we have a real First Amendment problem, right? Um, and, and I think, though, universal, it, we could find... I'm looking in my head as we speak for a space for legislation requiring some level of universal design in, in providing a tech platform. Uh, and, or at least a roundabout way would be an FTC kind of thing, the failure to warn that if I'm hosting your content and I haven't got ADA compliant design and you're gonna post on it, then I'm warning you that I'm not ADA compliant. Something, something to shame them into doing the right thing. Well, now we're really going to get out of talking about copyright here, but I, I mean, you're, you're speaking my language on this. I, I spent some time in my internet architecture paper talking about the, this is another shortcoming of, in the, in the same way that disability law, the ADA in particular, doesn't target copyrighted works directly, it also doesn't target platforms, right? It only targets the places that we can sort of conceive of as places of public accommodation. And, you know, the Shopify example is great, right? Because how many problems with sites on Shopify are a result of architectural decisions that Shopify has made and could fix thereby making all of its user sites accessible in that, that particular way. So strong, strong agree on the interventions with platforms. I think just as we think about publishers and rights holders as a point of intervention, platforms likewise are, have, have got to be a part of the agenda. The, the last thing I couldn't, couldn't leave alone since you mentioned the First Amendment, that's, that's the, the, the next paper that I, that I have coming out is on disability in the First Amendment. I actually, I, I'm really optimistic about that. I think that the history of the disability rights movement has a, shows a lot of encounters with the First Amendment. And uh, if Vicki is no longer here, Vicki knows, knows some of these encounters uh, painfully from her time at the FCC. But um, I, I actually think the disability rights movement is poised perhaps better than any other um, so the corner of the civil rights world to navigate some of the challenges of the First Amendment. So I, I, I won't soapbox about that. We're getting off topic, but stay tuned. I think I think there's an optimistic story to be told on the on the First Amendment. Looking forward. So with. Uh with uh, you know, hint for some of the next articles that are coming. I think it's a good time to wrap up our, our formal session. Thank everybody for coming. Blake, Blake, thank you for leading such a great discussion and, and uh, incentivizing us all to think a lot of interesting thoughts and, and to all the panelists, to Jack and to Caroline, Justice Yacoub. Um, it was a really great discussion today. Uh, we will edit uh, the video <laughs> before we post it. Um, and and make a transcript available uh, as well. And so it may take us uh, a couple days to post. It should be posted by next Tuesday or Wednesday or so. You can find that at pidgip.org and you can follow the, the link to our events page where we have um, all our past speaker series as well. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn off the video. Oops. Uh, Tanya, you're going to have to turn it off for me. I just got 